Hello, welcome to the Autism Research Coalition Friday afternoon webinar. This is Patricia Lemmer and my guest today is Dr. Michael Ellis. Hi, Michael. Hi, Patty, how are you? I'm great. Um, I'm in Pittsburgh, Dr. Ellis is in Long Island and he is a board certified pediatrician who specializes in kids with autism spectrum disorders, mitochondrial disorders, pandas, and all kinds of behavioral and metabolic problems. He's a MAPS doctor. MAPS stands for Medical Academy for Pediatric Special Needs. And he has been doing this for a long, long time. And um, he's got a great background. I'm not going to give you all his medical credentials, but rest assured that they're spectacular. And this is his. Is this is your second time on on the Autism Research Coalition? Is that right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, we had the I had the pleasure of being interviewed by you a couple of months ago. Right, and so we are going to be doing a series of trainings for parents and practitioners. And um, this one today is going to be on diet and nutrition, which are foundational as we know. And before we get started, I just wanna put in a little plug um, for the Brain Foundation. The Autism Research Coalition has partnered with the Brain Foundation and your tax deductible donations will be used wisely to support research on causes and treatments for autism spectrum disorders. So there's a banner there that tells you how to make that donation. And um, we hope that you will be generous and do that um, after this talk. So, um, one of my favorite expressions, Dr. Ellis, is that you are what you eat <laughs> and that you have to put good gas in a car to make it run. So this is diet and nutrition are foundational. And why are they so important, especially in kids with autism spectrum disorders? I think that it's a really good um uh, jumping off point is that we are what we eat. In fact, it's like putting the right fuel in your car. You wouldn't go to the gas station and put diesel fuel in a petroleum burning engine uh, because it's not going to run very well. It might run for a while. It also might just go and that's the end of the car. But usually that doesn't happen. But in the process of putting the wrong fuel in the engine, the engine becomes less and less efficient and it starts to break down. And the human body is the same way. So I like to look at the food that we eat as the fuel for our own engines or our generators. People commonly know about mitochondria, which are often referred to as the powerhouses of the cell. I don't really think it's the powerhouse of anything. To me, it's a generator, but if it doesn't have the right fuel, you're not gonna turn the lights on when there's a power failure. So where a generator might use propane gas or petroleum or ethanol, our generators need proteins, carbohydrates, fats that are derived from foods in addition to vitamins and minerals because that's what the mitochondria generator needs to create the electricity that moves oxygen through the cells. That's all they do. We need oxygen and anything that's gonna take the oxygen away from our cell energy, so-called oxidative stressors, or will definitely affect the way our body is gonna function. So imagine that every one of the zillions of cells in our bodies are doing work. And in order for them to do the work, they have to have the right fuel. So food is really important for basic survival. And so do you think that all the kids in the world with autism got together and decided that they were only all gonna eat macaroni and cheese and pizza and French fries? Or is there a reason that they have chosen this not very healthy diet? Um, good question. I think that it's not only the children with autism in the world. I think it's all the children in the world. I'm sorry to say that even as a parent um, of my children are now much older. They have their own children. 
But when they were little kids and there I was a practicing pediatrician, I thought it was kind of amusing that my son, for example, was a milk addict. He drank gallons of milk a week. And we used to say, oh, well, that's pretty weird. But, you know, it seems interesting. And he only chose to eat bagels and cheese and mayonnaise and more cheese and more milk and cereal. <laughs> then I have my daughter was not a milk drinker at all. And she only wanted to eat meat. She wouldn't eat anything else at all. So we were like running the diner. You know, the, my wife was like a short order cook. Everybody was eating something different. But I remember once asking my son, why is it that you don't want the hamburger or even the cheeseburger that mom makes? And my wife is quite an excellent cook. And you prefer to eat the burger from McDonald's or one of the fast food places. And he said, because the McDonald's one doesn't have any meat in it which I thought was really funny <laughs> because he was a little kid. And of course there's meat. And I will tell you with all due respect to McDonald's, because believe it or not, back in the day, I worked for McDonald's for a while when I was in college to make some money. And they did have very high standards for their um, beef. But it's funny that the child didn't know the difference. I said, why don't you want to eat macaroni and cheese that mom makes with like real cheese that's delicious and fresh and you know melts and it's so gooey and who doesn't like cheese? They would opt for the Kraft macaroni and cheese, which when I would take that orange powder and sprinkle it on the macaroni, my fingers would stain because of the dye and the artificial colors in that cheesy stuff, whatever it was. But of course I did it because that's what you did because kids watch TV in those days, it was TV commercials and you know, tricks are for kids and the little boy who was dressed up as a doctor with a lab coat saying, this is what you should eat because it's good for you. And that's what, and then the kids said, that's what they wanted. But now it's even more than just TV commercials because kids see it on social media. They can go on the internet. They can see pop-up ads for anything that they want. And unfortunately, most of the food that's advertised for children is really junk. Um, so why is this bad for, why is this macaroni and cheese and gallons of milk diet bad for kids with autism? But I assume your son did not become autistic. And what, what happens with this diet? What happens to their gut? What happens to their brain? And is it related to their behavior? Absolutely. So what happens is, and again, it's a good it's a good point that no, my son isn't autistic. I will tell you, when I look back when he was a child, he was definitely do some things that were, you know, somewhat strange that I thought he might have been walking the line of the hyperactive child. He used to have, you know, upset stomachs and would randomly get diarrhea and rashes and things. And I just figured, well, okay, we'll treat the rash and we'll treat the diarrhea the way we did for 50 years, and things would get better. But what's happening with the children on the spectrum is that the entire neighborhood and their gut, what we now call the, the microbiome, which is all of the organisms that have to live in the intestinal tract to digest food, are looking for the food that nature and genetics have programmed them to digest. And when something comes down the pike and they look at this and say, um, you know, what is that cheese doodle thing or that cracker or whatever, I don't know what to do with that then it subsets literally the process of digestion. It can create inflammation in the gut and therefore the nutrients that need to be absorbed or not because the whole bacterial composition of the gut, including um, the organisms that are responsible for digesting fats, for example, which is supremely important for the human nervous system, proteins, carbohydrates, which basically don't do a lot in the form that most kids eat, but feed more abnormal bacteria or yeasts, or fungi, or parasites. Um, we have everything gets completely out of whack and there creates a situation of what we call inflammation in the gut. And we're now, wired- Now as a doctor, do you, you take a history and you see that these kids are eating this garbage and this very limited diet, what is your first step? You Do you test, do you say, oh, eat your vegetables? <laughs> Well, the first thing is, of course, taking history. And yes, we do ask exactly what the child has eaten from the be beginning of time. Uh, were they breastfed? Um, how did they do? Did, were they formula fed? Did you have to have changes in formula? Um, oh, yes, my child was colic. My child had reflux. And I want to make a point just for a moment that most of the children who had reflux when they were infants still have reflux. 
uh, but they don't know that they have it because they're not literally vomiting or spitting up the way the babies do. The process is still there. Um, what were the stools like? What were the stooling pattern like? Do you remember changing your kid's diaper and going like, oh my God, I'm gonna throw up, the smell is so bad. Or for that matter, is your child toilet trained? And if so, please describe what the poops look like, which of course is always very funny. Everybody thinks it's very amusing, but there is a, a chart called the Bristol chart, which indicates literal pictures of descriptions of poop and with written descriptions aside of a photograph of what a normal stool versus an abnormal stool looks like. Honestly, most people don't even know what a normal stool looks like. I was just going to ask that. What does a normal stool look like? Well, it should be formed. It should be pieces. It should be tapered at the ends. It sometimes has ridges in it. It shouldn't smell like somebody died. Um, it shouldn't have a foul or acid odor. I mean, but everybody then will say, well, everyone's poop smells. And to be quite honest, I'll say, you know what, honestly, my poop doesn't smell unless I eat something strange. But normally stool has a little bit of an odor, but not one where you have to, you know, be concerned. And if they're still not sure what I mean about that, I'll say, let me ask you something. If your kid went to the bathroom, would I be able to go to the bathroom after they left? Or would I have to open the window, light a match and wait an hour before I could even walk in there without passing out? And that usually brings them to laugh, just like you are right now. But they get it. So, right. you know, the, the, the parameters of normal versus abnormal has to be. Um, addressed. If they're still in diapers, of course, you may not see pieces because they're squishing it because they're sitting on it. But how about this? When you wipe the diaper area, is it messy? Is it sticky? Is it gooey? Do you have to use like a million wipes or whatever you're using to clean the skin because it's so weird? Or is it like wipe, wipe, you're done? And that's that. So and that there the is frequency too, not just the consistency and the smell, but the frequency. Many of our kids go twice a week. Some of them go a hundred times a day, and some of them alternate between those. And that's related to food too, isn't it? A hundred percent. So yes, a lot of the kids are constipated. A lot of them have diarrhea. A lot of them vacillate from one to the other, but clearly this is an example of a dysfunctional bowel. It doesn't mean it's broken, it's just not working right. And again, you know, what goes down your throat and what comes out your rear end is basically going to give you some idea of how things are going on sort of in the middle of that pathway, which is where all the nutrients have to be absorbed. Um, it's a whole process from the time they start eating there's acid and there's histamine that's released in the stomach so that you can take a food that's a really big thing and break it down into little pieces because we can't digest this, but we can't digest that. And that process will start right away. So I'll ask the mother, um, when you feed your child, do they kind of like choke or gag or cough when they're eating? Oh yeah, that happens a lot. Are they very picky eaters? Like they want to eat and then they put it in their mouths and they sort of squirrel it away or they don't chew it or they certainly don't swallow it. Oh yeah, that happens often. Or do you notice that after they eat, they start to cough later on or they become very hyperactive or very unsettled or they start throwing themselves over the arm of a chair or curling or up in the fetal position. Ears. I sometimes see these red ears and these bright red cheeks, which doesn't mean that they're healthy, that they have that's, bright red cheeks. That's, usually, that, that's histamine. That's the histamine release. Just like if you were going to break out in a rash because of something that you contacted. And the irony is, is that when we talk about skin and things like eczema, which is, I think, really overdiagnosed in so many kids who go to the dermatologist because they have rashes. Oh, it's eczema. Well, it, eczema has a certain characteristic look and usually appears in skin fold areas and so forth, behind the ears, um, under the neck, in the creases of the elbows, under the arms, in the groin, in between the toes and fingers and so forth. And yet we see kids like a child that I saw yesterday, a beautiful, adorable little two-year-old boy, who looked like somebody threw like acid on his face. I mean, his cheeks, his arms, his legs, every part of his body was covered with this red raised scaly rash, except for his diaper area, which right away tells you that's an interesting presentation because usually if it was coming out in the stool or something like that, you would see it around the anal area or certainly around the genitals. So what goes into the body that can cause this kind of inflammatory reaction that shows up on the skin may still reflect what we'll call 
food allergies. I'm um, so glad you said that because that idea of food allergies is not um, agreed upon because some doctors, allergists who you go, these families go to say, oh, it's not a true allergy unless it's anaphylactic like strawberries or shellfish. But are these really allergies or are they sensitivities or what are they? Um, I think that this is semantics. I think the trouble is that people think an allergy has to be an itchy rash that you scratch or wheezing or sneezing or certainly anaphylaxis, which is much more severe where the throat is closing and all this other things going on. But allergy also reflects how the immune system works because our body has to recognize food as a friend or foe. When it comes into the intestinal tract, the organisms there saying, oh, I know what that is. That's beef. I can digest that. Or I know that's a, a fat that came from an egg or an avocado. Uh, oh, that's a sugar. That comes from a fresh fruit and some vegetables. But then they see the fruits that come from concentrated juices, fruit roll-ups, which is nothing more than dried fruit or all of the snacks and frankly, what I used to call junk food that I think I have and many other doctors have revised as just junk. And they go like, I don't know what that is. What is that Dorito? I'm not sure what to do with that. <laughs> um, so it creates a problem and sure it's they digest food. it. And sure kids always eat potato chips and Doritos and things, but our kids, the autistic kids, that's all they want to eat. So I'll always tell a parent, listen, anything that your kid craves, any food, even if you think it's a good food, is bad for them. And sometimes I'll even push the envelope and I say, you know what? Your child is like a crack addict. They're addicted to these foods because they're basically not feeding the child's nutritional needs. They're feeding all these other organisms in the gut that don't need to be doing what they're doing. And they crave it. So one of the other important questions to ask is, does your child crave any foods? And you know pretty much as well as I do 99% of them will always be craving sugars and carbohydrates. And then specifically, it's the stuff that comes out of the bags. The process, real, it's junk. There's no nutritional value, I'm sorry, to eating Doritos or corn chips or Cheez-Its or any of those things. Is it terrible to do? Do I eat a taco chip once in a while? Or Yes, yeah, sure. But these kids are eating it day in and day out. And it's constant eating which is another thing because a lot of the parents will say, my child eats and two hours later, they want to eat again and again and again and again. I used to think it was because they were burning up all those calories because they were so hyperactive. But then I realized that that's not what's happening. It's that their gut organisms are sending brain signals to the brain chemically, which is what we all do. And the brain goes, what's going on down there? What are we having? Are we having a fight? I mean, is there a fire burning in the stomach? What's happening? And then all of the consequences of the foods that we eat that can affect our behavior start to kick in because the body is a very well-connected, very well-oiled machine. And again, the best metaphor is if you put the wrong fuel in the tank, the engine isn't going to run right, right, except that our brains know the engine's not running right and starts to create a problem, which is supposed to tell you, oh, you have a stomach ache. You better stop eating it. That's why you have a stomach ache. But of course, you know, we're not that smart and anything that makes us feel sick, somehow we'll go, well, that really tasted good. I'm going to eat it again anyway. And so that's what as, as a pediatrician, good. do you do laboratory tests to look at which foods are problematic or just from the history, you know, because the child craves that food, that he should maybe not be eating that food and that it's problematic. And then you have to deal with the parent who says, yikes, but if he doesn't eat Doritos, he's going to starve. Yes. Well, here's what I also tell people. First of all, let's deal with the starving. My line is, um, I've been doing this particular work for about almost 20 years now. I've been a pediatrician for too long, 42 years or something like that. And I say, I haven't lost a kid yet to starvation. So they're not going to starve. They may not eat for a few days. I said, but then when they're hungry and they sit down at the table and you might have some colorful food, like some green vegetables, some other proteins and so forth, not just starches all over the place, then um, they will eat that just because they're hungry. And nobody believes that until they see it. And I will challenge anyone to ask any parent that I've ever dealt with who will say, oh, you know, that just never happened. 
every single parent who doesn't abide by any kind of dietary intervention from the beginning usually comes back in the end and says, you know what, I wish I did this two years ago because it is true my son or daughter is adversely affected when they eat certain foods. And again, it's not exactly the same for anyone, but it usually boils down to good, clean, preferably organic, because at least it's the cleanest kind of food we've got, given that we're sort of contaminating all of our food and water supply, not drinking soda, not drinking fruit juices, whether they're diluted or not. Water is good, you know, and they'll, but what about milk? Well, you know, then the classic line is, um, you don't look like a cow, your child is not a cow, and we're the only mammals on the planet that feed our children milk from another animal. You don't see Elsie the cow nursing the goat, okay? It doesn't work that way. Right. So there is a, um, a problem there. So historically is important. Tests will tell us, let's say, for example, we need to understand what the milk and the milk protein known as casein does and how it interferes with methylation and detoxification pathways because that milk protein, which is not the same protein that appears in human mother's milk, by the way, so a cow mommy and a human mommy are not producing the same stuff. Um, basically, that will interfere with the incorporation of other vitamins and minerals that allow the mitochondria, the generators, to do their job. So it's all connected. As far as testing for foods, the first thing I would do is look at the stool, and certainly there are these comprehensive stool analyses that can be done by various laboratories where they take the stool and they don't just look for the presence of bad bacteria like salmonella and shigella and so forth, which is what the typical gastrointestinal approach is, but they look for the presence or evidence of the presence of other organisms that either are there or their metabolites are there. And if that's, it's sort of like the trail of breadcrumbs that if you remember the old fairy tale of Hansel and Gretel, you know, mom sent the kids out to the woods, but leave yourself a trail of breadcrumbs so that you can find your way back. Well, mom didn't find Hansel and Gretel because they fell into the witch's house and God knows what happened over there. But she knew that they were there because there was the breadcrumbs. Our tests look for that proverbial, you know, um, trail of breadcrumbs. So you don't always have to find the organism, but you know something's there and certain bacteria normally live in the gut, which is what the GI doctors will say. So what if there's strep? So what if there's clostridia? So what if there's Klebsiella or Pseudomonas or other things? We all have that living in our gut, which is true. But the balance of who's right. doing what has been completely upset. And um, I guess in the adult world, one of the common nouveau diagnoses is SIBO, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Why does that apply to adults and why do they get treated? But we say the same thing about children. Nobody wants to listen. I don't understand that. I don't either. So, so um, you mentioned all the dairy products and the casein in the milk and that we shouldn't be drinking cow's milk because we don't want to be a, a one ton animal uh, like a cow. But or like me. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other common um, ingredient that these kids eat is wheat and that we know about the protein in wheat and how wheat is grown now with glyphosate and can you talk about how these kids how this affects their behavior and this wheat and dairy combination in our kids which is so prevalent and these many parents are looking to this gluten-free casein-free diet and does this help? Yes, it does. Um, the basic concept is that the so-called protein in, in the gluten, which comes from wheat, um, rye, barley, and oats, basically is known as gliadin. And there are obviously people who are genetically prone to having something called celiac disease, which is where they get overt inflammatory bowel scenarios. They, their children don't thrive or they're constantly having diarrhea and so forth. And they do all these fancy tests and say, oh, you have celiac disease. You can do this with a blood test. The difference is, is that some of these antibodies won't show up and therefore the, the mother will say, well, why should I go off of gluten? And the gliadin proteins also act like opiates in the brain, which I found very interesting. I didn't know that originally. So does the casein. So if you're going to trigger something in the brain that's almost acting like it's heroin, 
that's going to affect your child's behavior on some level. The other problem I found is that because the wheat and the grains grow in the ground, and you mentioned glyphosate, for example, which is also the product known as Roundup, which, of course, we start advertising, you know, in the Northeast in March when spring starts to happen. You know, you've got a weed, spray this stuff on your weed and you don't have to bend over and pull it out. I did it, but it was wrong. And these these pesticides and also maybe even more significantly, the molds that release what we call mycotoxins or toxins from these molds, which is part of nature because the things grow in the ground and it's wet. And we here, of course, have had a very hot and very wet summer. And basically we haven't had a frost or a winter in several years that really is long enough to kill these things is that the food is going to have these components and chemicals in them. So the government has things in place where they know this happens in the field and they mill it and they steam it and they sift it and they pasteurize it all for the purpose of cleaning it up. But then it gets stored in whatever storage facility and these toxic things just multiply. And then by the time we get it and it's turned into flour and you buy the bread, those ingredients have now been incorporated in the food and then we eat it and it creates another you know, inflammatory storm, if you will, that goes on in the gut and uh, causes all of these intestinal absorption issues. It destroys the microbiome. The good bacteria have no food, the bad bacteria are taking over and the brain goes, what's going on right now? I don't understand what's happening. So and we're that's back kind of the way I like balance. to approach it. And so I love tests. I, did, I spent my career running tests on kids and looking at that test data very carefully to figure out what some of the causes were for the behaviors and learning problems. So would this again, you talk about, are there molds? Are there yeast metabolites? Are there other kinds of things, uh, this dysbiosis or imbalance in the gut? Are there, as a MAPS doctor, you teach other doctors what tests to run and some of these parents are smarter than some of their doctors. They know about these tests. Can you talk to us about some of the favorite tests that, that you think are really, really helpful in, in figuring out what the next step would be? Absolutely. Um, well, we did mention the stool tests, which will okay. basically tell you if it looks like there's what looks like an allergic kind of scenario where a lot of what we call eosinophils or allergy cells will show up in the stool. Um, we, the pH of the stool, how acid is it? Because that will also imply whether there's a lot of acid reflux. Um, if there's a lot of acidity, the question is why, which then goes to what's living in the gut. But on the blood test side, if you look at basically the B vitamins and the star B vitamin that's at the top of the, of the formula, if you will, which is folic acid or vitamin B9, will be blocked by the introduction of casein, for example. Wow. Not to mention that certain children, it turns out that um, the research that was done, and um, I'm happy to say that um, my practice, this is going back now about 14 years ago, we started checking for what's now known as the cerebral folate blocking or binding antibodies. There are tests that can be done uh, that show that there are antibodies that are actually keeping that folic acid from getting into the mix. Well, if that's the first vitamin you need to start that methylation and detoxification pathway and you don't have it, it's like saying, I'm gonna bake a cake, but I don't have enough flour, so I'll just put in whatever I've got. And I'll take my chances. Your cake isn't gonna come out right. Right. So those are simple ways to do it. You can do blood tests routinely to look for B vitamins. You can look for um, the immune system to see if there's a high level of IgE antibodies, which implies there's some allergy. You can do a simple blood count to CBC and see what kind of white cells are there. Are there eosinophils telling you there's some systemic allergy thing going on? Um, are there a lot of monocytes which indicate inflammation? Again, we're not looking for infections here. Um, do a histamine level in the blood, which is something that you can see. Where's this histamine coming from? So we know we all have mast cells. They make histamine. But some of these kids have histamine levels that are two, three, four, eight, ten times normal. And the mother, of course, will tell you, you know, he's always itching and scratching. And sometimes they see a rash. Sometimes they don't. 
So those are blood tests that can be done. Then you get into the area of food allergy testing. I was taught that you could do what's called these um, IgG or IgE RAST tests. Um, IgE will measure the immune response to certain foods or IgG will do the same thing, except what I didn't understand when I first saw these tests is, how is it that this child is reacting to foods that he or she has never eaten in their lives? And the mothers will say to you, what do you mean he's allergic to avocado? He's never had an avocado. Or what do you mean he's allergic to, you know, some other thing like shrimp or some random food that the child's never really eaten? How is that possible? So then you have to explain how the immune system works. Does it recognize the good guys or the bad guys or is a little confused? And by the way, mom, what did you eat when you were pregnant? Because a lot of times this happens. And, you know, the mainstream theory is that if we introduce foods early on, which, of course, is completely the opposite of what I learned when I did my training. Um, for example, if we introduce peanuts early to children, then it'll lessen their allergies. Well, that doesn't seem to happen very well because it's not the peanuts that they're allergic to. It's the toxins in the peanuts that they're reacting to. So the immune system sees the peanut and says, oh, peanut, that's a good source of fat. Sometimes that's a good source of protein, other nuts. But peanuts, pistachios, and cashews are the highest containing nuts, uh, the highest content of those mycotoxins because they are either ground nuts or tree nuts. And then you'll find that even kids will react to um, coconut for example, and we know that coconut is a good anti-inflammatory. So now you have a mother says, well, I, I went on the internet and I spoke to, to other moms. They say, use coconut oil, add it to everything. And this is a kid who's reacting to everything that she's putting coconut oil in because the coconuts are also contaminated. Or the mother who says, I put my kid in one of those Aveeno oatmeal baths because he was so itchy. And of course, the classic was back in the day when people got chicken pox, but you know, we don't see that so much anymore, but they couldn't understand how am I putting my kid in a bath that's supposed to solve an itching problem and they're coming out beet red and totally itchy because they're allergic to the oats because the oats have the gluten. Wow. And even if you don't have to eat it, Patty. It's absorbed through your skin. It's absorbed through your gastrointestinal tract, just like all of those mycotoxins and pesticides and everything else that unfortunately we are doing to our food supply. I, I, have a, I have a friend who's gluten free and she's very careful about what she eats. And she didn't realize that her body lotion had gluten in it and that her the massage oil that she bought, that she was a masseuse and she was using on her, her clients that it had gluten in it. And that's right. Some of the common over the counter moisturizers have almond in them. Also, what if you're allergic to the almonds and you don't know it? You say, oh, I'll put some, uh, you know, Eucerin or Cetaphil. You know, I probably shouldn't be using brand names. But, you know, you, what the bottom line is you got to read labels, yeah. which is true about the foods as well. Look and see what it says. Look at the inactive ingredients. Yeah, we know it's nuts, but what else is in there? Because people use the term cross-contamination very liberally. I'm not sure that it's cross-contamination. I think it's direct contamination. The crossover part is what happens in the human body when the immune system recognizes something that it knows, but it's now attached to something that it doesn't know and it's foreign. So it doesn't like that thing. So it starts making antibodies to potentially even a good food. Like what's wrong with strawberries and blueberries? Those are the high antioxidant foods. We will tell people to eat those things. But again, does your child eat like three little baskets of strawberries and want more? Something's up. So your blueberries, when you take them out, have that little fuzzy, whitish, bluish stuff on it. That's patulin. That's a mycotoxin. That's a mold. So you wouldn't eat that. And the joke is you say, oh, I'm going to cook it. It'll be fine. When you heat these things up, they become more toxic because heat activates many of the toxins. So it's a real complicated scenario. But again, this is why you have to spend the time with each individual um, patient and get a good history um, and examine the child and see if you have evidence of this. Are they bloated? Do they have a distended belly? You can always do the old dermatographia test, you know, where you can literally write your name on a kid's belly and it comes out red because their histamine levels are so high. I'm not talking about writing with a pen. I'm talking about I use my fingernail. You could use a tongue depressor or something that's not really sharp. Just draw a line. All of a sudden, a big red line appears. It's an old doctor trick. 
But nobody knows that anymore because, you know, you like tests. I like tests too, but I also like to use my brain and say like, what's going on here? Because then I want to order the tests appropriately. So, I mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours because it's not that simple. And again, I think one of the reasons why we're into this mess called autism, which is a worldwide epidemic um, that people unfortunately are not paying a lot of attention to, is that every child is different. So one diet for one kid might be not the diet for another kid. And when people say, do you like the GAP diet or the SCD diet or the gluten-free, casein-free or whatever, I say, you know, tell me what you eat Tell me what you see coming out of your kid's body. Tell me if they're wetting themselves all day as opposed to just being, you know, nocturnal bedwetters, which is somewhat more acceptable for younger children for a while. Tell me about all of those things because their behaviors are the clues here. And that's where we have to play, you know, good detective, I think. So how do you, you, know, you, how do you help a family choose a diet? Do you, they, you know, many families are on this gluten-free, casein-free diet, and it's not adequate because they've replaced gluten-laden and casein-laden junk food with gluten-free, casein-free junk food. And Correct. there's you just answer, nutrition. And right, so, you just answered the question, I think, right there. Okay, but, the problem is, is remember, if there's toxins in the food and you take the gluten out, there's still grains. So right. you have to consider what else is in the food. But that was a really good example because gluten-free is not necessarily the way to go. But I'll tell you the truth, what would be ideal, and this is, again, is I think you even um, referred this, to, uh, reference this in your book. Um, if your grandmother didn't eat it, then you shouldn't eat it either. The trouble is, is that now I'm the limb father and I may not be the best example of what I ate because I grew up, you know, in the, in the 50s and 60s and I was a victim of television advertising. My mother was a lousy cook, so there you so go. So we have to say great grandmother now. And that's, yes. that's a Michael Pollan quote from um, his, his book, Food Rules, which I love, Food Rules. It's a little $10 book. And I don't know whether he meant rules as a verb or a noun, but that's Probably both. Rule. Probably <laughs> that's both. Rule. But that's yeah. okay. So, but, you know, when I tell people, ideally eliminate all the grains, eliminate corn, which is a nightmare, and it's in everything. And most moms will say, I don't know what to buy because every label I pick up is corn, this corn. It's in infant formula. When I fed my kids formula, when they went off a of breast, there was not 40 or 50% corn syrup in there. And now that's what's in all, even the good formulas, the ones that are supposed to be better, still have, as my kids pointed out to me, you know, dad, that stuff that costs $40 a can still has corn syrup in it. Um, um, so in Pittsburgh, they think corn is a vegetable. Yeah, well, I don't know. Is it a vegetable? Is it a starch? I personally never like corn. For me, it's anything great. that goes in your mouth and comes out your rear end the same way doesn't make me happy. So I'm just saying, you know, but that's just me. All right, so we're going to take out the grains. We're going to take out the sugar. We're going to take out additives, colors, flavors, preservatives. What we want is real food. Real right, food and nobody knows grown what without pesticides in a natural way in season. Good luck with that. Because okay. unless you, and you know, people say, well, I have a vegetable garden in my backyard. I said, that's great. Where do you live? Because the ground is where the poisons are as well, the aquifers, the water supplies and so forth. So what you're doing by growing your own or, or buying organic is that you're not adding more chemicals to the mix. Right. But that doesn't mean that the plant that you're eating isn't sucking some of that stuff up from the ground. And that's usually when the parent goes like, okay, I, I give up. Then, then my, there's nothing my child can eat at, at all. I said, you do the best you can do. And you basically go for fresh fruits and vegetables, which are the source of carbohydrates. You can eat beans and legumes, which most kids don't eat, except for, you know, certain different backgrounds of people where they actually do that. Um, you can eat meats uh, that can be organic. You don't have to drink milk from a, any animal at all. You know, again, people go, well, what about rice milk? What about almond milk? Well, they also have the obvious consequences, given that they made from rice and almonds, which are not necessarily the best choices either. And again, they think it's the best source of calcium and vitamin D, which it really isn't. And that's when I know they're probably watching too much TV because <laughs> this is not factual information. This is how we sell products. 
And I'm embarrassed to say that I think the more, um, let's say, the more upscale our, our society might be, or if we grew up in cities and so forth, we very often are the ones that know less and less about eating. My patients who come from other countries, from the islands, from places where mom and grandma is still making their own foods and so forth, those people know how to eat. We don't. Right. And we haven't for probably at least a generation and a half now, which is why there's so much illness around. Autism is just another example of another chronic illness that we're seeing not only in children, but we're seeing it in adults too. And nobody ever addresses the question of why are there so many asthmatic children? Why are allergies worse every year? You hear this every season, you know, this is the worst allergy season ever. Well, what's the answer to that question? I like to ask the why questions and nobody else, including all of my colleagues in, in the pediatric world, I don't need to know about another asthma medicine. I want to know why there's so much asthma. And don't tell me it's for inner city kids because they're exposed to cockroach dust, because that's not the answer. It's not the but answer. that was what I was taught. That so doesn't seem to work. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the B vitamins? I mean, obviously, B vitamins are really important and the the folate is really important. How how do you deal with a child who has folate antibodies? And what about B12 and B, B1 and B2? These are essential vitamins that come have to come from food. Correct. And the reason they're essential is because it's like the fuel that makes the engine run. Right. And if you look at what's called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, which is how the mitochondria get turn on the energy and then go through several phases to create that electricity to move oxygen. It all starts with proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. So imagine they got to go into the gas tank, all right? Then you need all of those B vitamins and zinc and copper and calcium and magnesium and a whole bunch of other minerals that also come from food to make enzymes or switches get turned on so that you can produce whatever it is you're trying to produce. So um, if there's a compromise or there's a roadblock somewhere, then those vitamins may be available. So when we do the testing in the blood, we'll find like, wow, look at that. Your child's B12 is really high. Their folic acid is really high. Their B6 is really high. Sometimes the B1 is really low. And of course, B1 and, or thiamine deficiencies have been associated with neurological symptoms but they get confused. I don't understand, doctor, why are you telling me my kid is deficient in these things if there's too much of it in the blood? I said, it's in the blood, it's not getting into the, it's in the gas tank, but it's not getting to the engine, okay? It's having it, but not being able to use it is almost like not having it at all. Right. So that's, that's kind of the way that people tend to understand um, what a blood test actually means. And then, of course, with the other things um, like the fats, you need to know, does the carnitine work? Because that's the train that takes the fat into the cells and makes it work. So if there's a carnitine problem, um, which is easily tested in the blood, there's an issue. If the fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K are off, then you have to wonder, like, what's up with that? Why is the problem? Some of it could be genetically programmed, but most of it is because there's inflammation in the gut. I didn't even know that vitamin K was made by the enterocytes, by the intestinal cells. So, you know, when you see there's an abnormal vitamin K level, it's not just about giving the child vitamin K. It's like saying, well, why are they not making it themselves? What's going on with that? So and it's, like, it's like looking for a recipe. You know, you need the ingredients to make whatever it is that the recipe is allowing you to make. If and you, you have to have the, recipe, the right amount of the, those exactly. ingredients. And if and you don't, you don't have, have it. put other ingredients. Or, well, look at it this way. You have what you need, you put it in the mixer, you make the dough, now you gotta put it in a pie tin. That's the next step. Well, your recipe calls for a nine inch pie tin and you only have a 12 inch sheet pan. Well, that's not gonna work because it's, the, it's, and then even if you have the right size pie tin, so you're gonna make your nice crust for your nice fresh fruit pie, then you put it in your oven and your oven temperature is off by a few degrees, right. a little low, a little high, that's like your intestinal tract. What's the cake? What's the crust going to come out? What's the dough going to come out like? What's the bread going to look like if it doesn't bake at the exact right temperature for the prescribed amount of time? It's not going to come out right. And that's exactly what happens with these kids when they eat these things and um, 
uh, you know, and then of course you wind up with what we talked about, all this bowel dysfunction and so forth, which is you really talk, we, we talked about food and getting your vitamins and minerals and proteins and carbs and fats from food. Can you talk a little bit about all these kids who are picky eaters and whose parents say he'll never eat that? Are you, do you use supplementation? And how, yes. how do you use supplementation? And how are, talk about different methods of, do, of giving it. Is it, should you take a pill or should it be a liquid? And, and how do you know what a child needs? Um, that's a really good question. And yes, the reason why supplements do come in handy is because if your child isn't eating, if they are still the picky eater, you have to introduce this from another source, which usually comes out of a bottle. Um, but there are, you know, supplements that used to be supplement. The word supplement implies that it's in addition to something else. When we used to take supplemental vitamins, or when my kids did, it was supposed to be an additive to ensure that they had what they needed. Ironically, most of the things that I used or that I prescribed were not enough to fill a toenail as far as what the body really needs. But I did it because that's what I was told to do. You do have choices. There are liquids, there are pills and so forth, but you have to then realize if they're liquids, are they flavored? because the artificial flavors and colorings that are available in most of the over-the-counter uh, vitamin supplements are also loaded with toxins. So you don't want to do that, which is why a lot of the vitamins that a lot of uh, the doctors like me would prescribe tend to be a little bit more on the expensive side, but it's because they're clean. You're not going to find them on the shelves of your local you know, drugstore. You need to either order them from companies that make these things and they make them clean and they stand by their products, or you have to figure out a way to do it yourself. So the extreme case would be what we now call these mitochondrial cocktails, which is nothing more than a multivitamin, minerals and so forth, but the people involved in the research and formulating these compounds have asked people like me, what do most of the kids need? What's the biggest problem? I said, the biggest problem is mothers and fathers do not like to have 20 bottles of things on their kitchen counter and figure out what to do. They do not like the expense of doing it. It's annoying and they hate it. So we tried to come up with things that either come in a powdered form that's flavored without artificial stuff that is free of gluten, corn, soy, rice, and um, casein and so forth. And it has to be labeled as such according to the FDA's requirements, um, even though supplements are not really under their um, thumb so much as like drugs are but they do work. And there are some really good products out there where either it can be made in a liquid form and the best part is you don't have to drink a gallon of water with it. You can just mix a little bit of the powder depending on how much your child weighs and you have to give it, but you also have to give it twice a day because our bodies work on 12 hour clocks and we need to be fed and nourished on according to what our, our systems need. But they're available in capsules as well. I have some Big kids, teenagers, even some of the parents of the children said they started taking the same supplements as their kid and they've never felt better. Their cholesterol's gone down, their blood pressure's gone down, they're sleeping better, their skin is cleared up. And of course, what everybody likes is they've actually lost weight. Because when you eliminate a lot of these foods, right. you're eliminating the ability for all these unnecessary useless carbohydrates to be stored as fat, which is what the liver does. And what happens is after a while, you get too much fat and the storage facilities, all of our fat cells are too fat and too loaded with fat. And then the liver becomes fatty. And now we have this, these problems where kids are presenting with uh, um, abnormal liver enzymes. And of course, the pediatrician gets all hysterical and sends them to the gastroenterologist. And they say, we need to do a liver biopsy. And it's like, hold on, stop a minute. Let's think about what is this telling us? The liver is saying, uh-oh, something's wrong. I'm having a real problem here and I can't do my work. And that's why these things are changing. But again, it's all putting, it's again, it's for me, it's putting the pieces of the puzzle together. It's very hard to generalize, but that's where supplements do come in because it makes up for what your kid isn't eating. They don't want to eat green vegetables, fine. Here, here it is in a pill or a capsule. Yeah, but it's the, I think the most important point that you made is that they are supplements. They are secondary to the foundational thing which keeps us alive, which is food. 
and you have to have food to get your, the bulk of your nutrition and then you can supplement it. And if you get your fats from salmon or avocado or other good fish, sardines, and you may not need to take an essential fat as a supplement. And many of our kids need those supplements because they can't, won't even be in the same room as a fish. But or a sardine. You tell a parent, oh, say, mom, you know what? Give your kids sardines. They're like, what are you, nuts? People from, <laughs> people from Europe, however, their children eat sardines. Right. And those small little fish, the smaller the fish, the better it is. Right. You mentioned salmon. The trouble is now everybody's eating salmon, except most of it is not um, wild salmon. It's farm raised. And those fish are being fed like cornflakes or something. I don't know what. They don't even look at salmon is also a color. It's that peachy pink color. Did you ever cut into a piece of salmon and it looks white? That's devoid of all of those essential right. fats. And our brains and our cells are made of fat. And if yes. you, and for example, going back to the microbiome, if you don't have the right probiotic, the good bacteria in your gut, they're the ones that absorb the fats. So they're sitting there like saying, okay, I don't know what to do right now because there's nothing here that I want. Let's get rid of it. Right. But it's not easy to do that all the time. So here's here's the really the hardest part that I have ever had to deal with with families. And I know you deal with this every day with the parent who breaks down and says, this is too hard. I just can't do it. I just can't do it or and or it's just too expensive. I can't afford it. How what do you say to these families? Well, the ones who say it's too hard, I kind of diffuse that because I, I will say, yes, this is very hard. You didn't ask for this, but this is what happened. OK, and nothing in life is easy. I mean, it's almost like I feel like the, the parent now. Stop complaining. Um, if your child had a broken leg, you would go to the hospital and you would get the kid x-rayed and you would put the child in a cast. And that's having your kid in a cast for six weeks is pretty hard, too. But you do it because, you know, that's how you're going to heal your child. If God forbid, and this may not be the best example, is that your um, child has been diagnosed with cancer, you're online for chemotherapy in the next minute. You don't even care what that drug is going to do, but you know it's going to stop the cancer. You're not going to question it. How hard is that? So I try to put it in the, in the context of this isn't life and death. This is about health. You want a healthy child? You came to me for guidance? This is what I'm going to tell you. Just go to your kitchen cabinet, take a giant hefty trash bag and take all of the crap and put it in the garbage bag and leave it out for the garbage men or give it to somebody you don't like. OK, because you don't you. It's just as easy to go down aisle three in the supermarket as it is to go down aisle one. And by the way, yes, if you shop in a place like Whole Foods, yeah, it costs a lot of money to eat healthy. And that's unfortunate. But you know what? You'll spend money on something on that and you won't spend money on something else. And again, you know, I'm not there to judge like, so you won't buy your kid 12 new outfits this year, but maybe people can't afford to do that. But pick and choose. You're still spending money. Even if you don't spend a lot of money, you're still buying stuff. Buy the fruits and the vegetables. Don't buy the cereal in the box. And the whole it's foods. I mean, you mentioned whole foods. They put things on sale. They put their expensive products on sale once in a while and you can stock up on them. And I love, it's a, kind of a game for me with the Amazon Prime. If you have an Amazon Prime account, you get another 5% or 10% at Whole Foods on their sale products. So and it seems, yeah, I think everybody must be able to get Amazon because that's all you see is delivery trucks now with the smiley face. Right, right. Right. So um, we have a couple of questions here. One about fermented food. How do you feel about fermented foods? Again, they do work in some cases, but sometimes they're foods that are being fermented that also have other issues. And the foods, you know, have to make sure they're not particularly toxic. I know some people like to make their own sauerkraut and stuff like that. But again, the whole idea is you're trying to introduce probiotics through that fermentation process into the gut. And very often, if there's other issues with the gut, they're not going to work very well. So I, it wasn't really one of my things to push fermented food, but to push the good food and then supplement with the proper type of probiotic with the understanding that 
certain foods are going to kill these organisms off in the gut. So fermented food is fine, but what else are you eating? So right. you might you might actually kind of negate the value of what you're trying to do. And I will say something um, about nutritionists. There are a lot of good um, people out there, some of whom I've met through MAPS and other conferences, who are very well versed in childhood nutrition, but childhood nutrition 2021, not the people who are still talking about the food pyramid, not the people who serve school lunches and think that they're feeding their kids healthy food by giving them carbohydrates on top of carbohydrates on the tray. And um, ketchup is a vegetable in school lunches. Did you know that? What? Ketchup is a vegetable. Oh, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I better go, I better go have some right now because it'll be my vegetables for the day. Right. I, I think, you know, I tell people, think about the paleo diet. Well, why is that good? I said, well, they call it the caveman diet because, you know, man created grain. Nature, God, whatever you believe, did not put wheat on this planet. We made it. And basically, if it was here on the planet when the first type of human homo sapien type person showed up, it was there because somebody knew that was the fuel that we needed. We don't need granola bars. OK, we don't need uh doritos we don't need the milk from the cow remember they killed the cow because they took the hide for warmth and then they said oh well there's some meat muscle let's let's put it over on a fire once they figured out how to make fire and then they were eating meat otherwise what did they eat fish and vegetables they would you know because they weren't able to cook meat or kill animals as well right. so it sounds kind of ridiculous but it makes a lot of sense if you take two minutes to think about it it seems like a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. So there's some questions about nutritionists. There's a couple of nutritionists out there who have written books about um, feeding kids with autism. And um, those who are asking those questions, if you go to a bookstore or to Amazon or to Barnes and Noble online, you can look, put in both the words nutrition or diet and autism. And this also helps the problem of how difficult it is and how to make kid friendly recipes. And right. some of them are how to sneak in a little bit of zucchini in that muffin that you're making for the morning or carrots, if you grate right. zucchini or carrots. And so some of those nutritionists are are very good at figuring out exactly what those kids need and to make it simple to cook. That's correct. Um, it's also important to realize that there are ways to sneak in foods. There are ways to do things. I think smoothies actually work pretty well because so they, they taste sweet because they're naturally sweetened. In some cases, it's okay to use stuff like um, stevia, which is a naturally sweet plant. Um, but it's not sugar cane or pure sugar. Um, is it ideal? No. But another way to sweeten things is with maple syrup. And I underscore the fact that when I say maple syrup, I don't mean log cabin or what we used to call Aunt Jemima because that's corn syrup or pancake syrup. If I go and eat pancakes out for breakfast, which is a treat for me, and they give me this syrup and it comes out of this little, you know, package thing, they don't even call it maple syrup. They call it breakfast syrup. My tongue burns when I eat that <laughs> stuff. Okay, it's just bizarre. And but but you know, if you get used to it, then you're used to it. Um, honey is another thing that you can use that sweetens things. You don't want to go to the artificial sweeteners. You don't want to put in a lot of sugar. And fresh fruits have a natural sweetness that tastes good. Teach your child to drink that. Plus, the smoothies are a great way to hide in other vegetables. And by the way, you can put your supplements in most of the time. Yep. And if the kid drinks the smoothie, then you've now have found a real easy way to get your child to drink the supplements and hide them because let's face it, most of them are not gonna swallow them because you say you need to swallow this now. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very broad stroke. I know some people are asking for recommendations of good nutritionists. I think this is, it's not appropriate for me to throw people's names around, but as you said, it's easy enough to find out. Um, I think that if they um, go uh, to even virtually attend now, uh, the Autism One conferences, the National Autism Association conferences, which are designed for parents and lay people, not practitioners necessarily, 
to understand what's out there, what's available. But again, be careful because once we get too commercial about everything, then we're going to start making the same mistakes. It's just hard to re-educate an entire generation of people that they've been doing it all wrong. Right. And, and, and everything that, you know, the kids see every minute is a problem. And the child who goes like, oh, well, I'm going to Johnny's birthday party. And the mother goes, well, how is he going to go to a birthday party if he's gluten free? I said, you know what, if he has a piece of birthday cake one day, it's not going to kill him. But if it's the birthday cake with the buttercream with like the artificially colored blue icing, he might not sleep that night. Or he might have really loose stools or he might break out in a rash or he might just act more autistic. And then you figure it out, mom. You saw what you did. Take one of those zucchini laced muffins and send it and talk to the mother of the child whose party it is and say, can you make sure that my kid has this instead of that? It's not that hard. Most mothers are probably the most compassionate people because they're going through their own issues with their kids. You know, the rest of us, you know, fathers forget it. We don't understand anything, apparently. And it's so we got to count on the moms. This has been fantastic, Dr. Ellis. Can you, um, we, we've put up your um, contact information. You're in Long Island, New York, and you're in L.A. once in a while. Um, and I think people want to know, well, how long am I going to have to wait to see you? Do you have a long waiting list or can we get in? Um, I think within certainly right now, from what I understand as like yesterday, between a month and six weeks or so. But, you know, I have time. I'm there. I also have a a lovely uh, nurse practitioner who's certified pediatrics who's working with me. So that helps open up the time more. So getting into the office for the initial visit, at least if you can't see me, you can see um, Marielle, for example. And if you, uh, at least she does the intake and then she and I do the work and then we come up with a plan, a game plan, if you will. And then if you want to follow the plan, that's fine. And in the meantime, they can read my book, right? Yes. And I will say, and I'm doing something totally uncool, but this is the book. Where is it? Outsmarting Autism. I will tell you, everybody has a book. Everybody writes a book. I have a shelf full of books. And I will tell you that yours is one of the first books that I actually not only enjoyed reading while I was on vacation a couple of weeks ago, but I actually read it. And it's written in a way that parents can understand it. You have put all of these things together in a way that people can understand that only could make my job easier. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for your testimonial. And thank you for your knowledge and your compassion and your understanding and your work and that you're still there in the trenches helping helping our kids it's just wonderful to have a resource like you so i love well, this thanks. opportunity to to have these conversations with you and um hopefully we they, they will continue and um i think you're just great what you're doing to help our kids and i i love your approach so and I love talking to you, so we're even. <laughs> <laughs> so, Enrique, thank you for putting us together. And again, remember to make your donation to the Brain Foundation. This is where the research is going to be done. And, um, and we love the people that they fund and give us help for our kids. So thank you again. And um, we'll be back. I don't know when our next session is. Uh, month six weeks two months but we'll continue our conversation then so that sounds like a great great plan okay thank you everybody for for listening in bye-bye bye